sorry for a bit of delay for technical reasons. <coughs> So a warm welcome to my students and colleagues. It's my privilege to introduce my friend and collaborator, Dr. Abhik Ghosh from Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, for today's talk. He did his BSTAT, MSTAT, and PhD from Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, in years 2010, 12, 15, uh, respectively. In fact, he secured third position in BSTAT and topped the MSTAT. Currently, he is an inspired faculty in the Interdisciplinary Statistical Research Unit of Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, India. Before joining as a faculty in ISI, he spent nearly a year in the Department of Biostatistics, University of Oslo. His research interests span important topics of applied statistics, like new family of density-based divergences, density power divergence, robust inference for non-identically distributed data, data robustness under Bayesian paradigm, robust methods for survival and extreme value analysis, robustness of hypothesis testing, robust methods in biostatistics and biometrics, etc. He received a number of international and national awards, including the 2017 Conference Award uh, for Biostatisticians from the prestigious International Society for Clinical Biostatistics, or ISCB. The first place of the 2013 uh, uh, Chan Timberchen Award for uh, Young Statisticians from Developing Countries given by International Statistical Institute. The 2016 ISCA Young Scientist Award in Mathematical Sciences, including Statistics, from Indian Science Congress Association of India. The Professor A. M. Mathai Award for Best Research Paper published in the year 2016 in the area of applicable mathematics from Indian Mathematical Society and many more. So a very warm welcome uh, to Abhik and the stage is yours for the talk. Thank you. and thanks to Devakoda for inviting me here and such an overwhelming introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the minimum distance inference in high dimensional data. And it's a review of its past, present and future kind of things. So one thing I would like to mention at the beginning that this I'm being a core statistician. I'm not so good in computing like you guys. So it is more uh, like a theoretical talk and kind of review of the existing literature in the context of high dimensional data analytics, which is a very hot topic now worldwide. So here you will learn for those methods which exist. And towards the end, I will discuss some of the possible problems where we can do further development and so those are the possible research topic where actually we are collaborating with other and also with the uh, Varkula. So that's the overview of the talk in that way. So first I will mention briefly the motivation, the scopes and challenges of this high dimensional data analysis. Then the starting of this era was with the famous lasso, if you have heard of their name, and it's some properties mostly from the background of mathematical and statistical properties and direct extension of lassos uh, in several specified problems and then we i will come to the robust inference under this high dimensional data so what is robust inference uh, the, it's basically where actually i works is the inference method which are stable against the outlying observations or noise in your terms. So this, how we can get stable inference in a high dimensional settings. And then there are many ways to do that. One of the ways which I works in the minimum distance approach. So I will discuss that approach and its high dimensional extension. And the second approach for robust estimation is the M estimation approach. 
So I will briefly mention these two approaches, a bit more on this minimum this divergence because there I have some works and then I will end with the future scopes and the possible research where there are scopes of collaboration. And in this regard, one thing is for each of the problem I discuss or each of the methods I mention, there are two part of it being in a high dimensional context. One is the mathematical or statistical and another is this computational challenge where we need to find an efficient algorithm to compute it where we have millions of variables. So, but my talk is limited to the mathematical or statistical part. As I have mentioned that I am not as good as you guys in terms of computation. So you have more expertise, but you will, so I want to give you a favor of which kind of mathematical properties we need when proposing a new method in this context. Okay. So, yes. so let's start with linear regression, which is famous, uh, you guys are familiar with mostly. Uh, so the basic problem is that we have a response variable, so n number of response values in R, and then we have a predictors, a set of predictors, x1 to xn observation, and these predictors are p-dimensional predictors. So we have p features to predict or estimate y. And then with the famous linear regression model is with additive error is like this, you all know. And so our objective is then to estimate what is beta. And the common estimate we use in classical setup we, where we have number of features is less than the number of observations. So we have more observation than the number of features. Then this is the estimate. We all know it's OLS, MLE, method of memories, any of those nice properties. All those nice properties is attained by this estimator. And so it is everything. But when we have high dimensional setting, I I'm coming to the examples and you also know it, but in terms of mathematics, in high dimensional settings we have number of features is much more than number of observations. So the if there could be two things. One is polynomial order. This is uh, where P is of the order n power alpha. It's a bit slightly high dimensional. And then you have non-polynomial order where P is of the exponential of n. So that's sometimes referred as ultra high dimensional where the challenge is much more because the parameter P is growing uh, in a exponential rate of your sample size. And what happens if P is greater than N? This estimator is surely not going to work as is directly evident from here. Why? Because this X is a P cross N, sorry, N cross P matrix and so its rank can be at most the minimum of a and p but its dimension x prime x is n cross n sorry x prime x is p cross p it is n cross p matrix so p cross p so if n is less its rank is n and dimension is p so if this inverse doesn't exist so we cannot have this estimator so it's very clear so we need something more or some new estimator. And there comes the new estimator, which I will come. But before that, there are plenty of high dimensional data around us, which you all know. This comes from the omics data in biometrics or biostatistics. So there are in medical study, we observe maybe maximum of 200 or 500 people. But if we do their omics, genomics or phenotypes, genotypes, etc. Many biological measures, those are in thousands of numbers. But we cannot do the medical experiment on thousands of patients. So those are the high dimensional data. And then there comes text or image mining, social media analysis, in climate research. You have various features but number of data may be limited in many cases. And so what are the challenges? As I have explained that beta height is not uniquely defined because that inverse of that matrix doesn't exist. And so valid statistical inference using that beta hat, which is the classical way, is not going to work here. And one thing is important, even if we have so many features in the data, 
it cannot be that all the features are related to the target response. So there are only few features which are important to response and that we can track in the later, we can track only those important features. So it is more important in that sense to do variable selection which are the important features to deal with and obviously the complex computational complexity that's always hidden in the high dimensional set. So the way is to deal with that to develop new statistical inference such as regular, regularized estimation or variable selection and that is done through the penalized approach and that's the beginning of uh, beginning of this era is with lasso. Now, before going to the details of the lasso, I have in the title made past, present and future. So what is past, present and future? And as shown in this figure, there is no clear past, present, future of this, uh, this topic. Because this is completely a newly developed topic. You can say all of them are recent. But just to explain, I have made some partition of it so that the past means the lasso, the starting point and is some extension for, uh, which are done around before 2000 maybe. So it started from 1996, the lasso paper. And then around 2000 and things like that. So lasso and its extension. And then in the present which now people are working on is the beyond regression. Beyond the simple regression setup, the extension of in various different problems like if, if you have heard of the name logistic regression uh, and things like that for discrete response and then the people are also working on the significance testing how to test for the, the significance of the parameters which are much more recent than the first attempt where people do only estimation and variable selection and then the advanced issues like there are a couple of issues I will talk about the robustness issue related to minimum distance and things like that but there are many issues like endogeneity if you know regression there is some more issue endogeneity, collinearity etc and in future what could be its extension ok so having said that here is the lasso formulation so we have that classical regression model in mind simple regression at y equal to x prime beta plus epsilon and <coughs> what how we estimate beta now if you remember or if you know the regression a bit more you can check that that beta hat formula is nothing but the minimizer of the first quantity the what is this this is the l2 norm square so it is the square distance between the response and the fitted values so this is the square so that classical method is to minimize only this part now what lasso do lasso do are uh, this a uh, parameter times this is the l1 norm so it puts what is this is called a penalty so it puts a penalty on the regression estimates and then we minimize the whole objective function now at the first attempt the things become much more complicated in terms of computational things why because initially this was a being l to not it was convex and always differentiable etc so we have a fixed optimum fixed minimizer which given by that solution uh, but when we introduce this penalty things becomes complicated why because this l1 norm is not differentiable at zero so we cannot just differentiate these things and to get the optimum and so there are several computational algorithm as i mentioned previously i am not going to the computational things that you can check later so i will explain what are the special properties of it we have okay but what's the most important thing about it that uh, help it to use in the high dimensional context is is auto sorry automatically variable selection property <laughs> so uh, that's why it's called regularized legu, sorry regularized or penalized estimator and it automatically makes some of your estimate as zero and some as non-zero <coughs> okay this is because uh, if you are from a mathematical background this property is coming from the 
geometry of the L1 norm. Because if you know L1 norm is a kind of di diamond set. So it has a some corner. If your optimum hit that corner, it makes those variables zero. But that's what mathematical background. If you, if you don't know that, you don't need to bother about it. So, but it's the important thing that it automatically selects some variable as non-zero beta values and makes all the other variables having zero coefficients. So, and this regularization is controlled by this parameter lambda. So, always we need to choose this lambda appropriately. Like, larger values of lambda will select lesser non-zero variables. So, it makes more values to zero. Why? Because if you take larger values of lambda, this part will dominate the total minimization process and then the minimizer of this quantity is zero. Minimizer of L1 norm of beta. So that makes more towards zero and if lambda is small, then this part gets more weight and so we have more non-zero values. Now choice, there are several methods of choice, uh, choice of lambda as it is not possible to go into details of everything so i will mention in several cases i will mention only the names like here so choice of lambda one choice is cross validation but the problem is is tends to select more false positives so which features are not important they come into your final model and there are some more advanced approach like bic based approach or regularization path approach Okay. So there are several advanced approach to choose the lambda. So, and then what are the properties? So why now I am going to a bit more mathematical things. So this part could be a bit boring. But why I am showing it to you? I will try to explain it as much as possible without the equation. So although equations will be there in the slides. The thing is whenever you are doing or proposing a new method of estimation in high dimensional things to make it a good work you always need to prove it some of its properties so only empirical evidence may not be very good in most cases and so this will give you a flavor of which kind of assumption you may need and which kind of properties you may need to prove it because this is a kind of benchmark the lasso is so whichever new property we are proposing you need this kind of benchmark so i will just explaining a bit of to give you a flavor of this which kind of mathematics is behind this or any method so i will explain it in detail for this lasso and but not for the extension so i will only mention the extensions but the properties are similar or extension of these properties okay so just for this case i will explain it a bit more mathematically so the first assumption we need to do any uh, high dimensional data analysis is the sparsity because if you know me a bit of the estimation theory we cannot estimate efficiently the parameters which are more in number than the sample size because there is something called degrees of freedom how much we can talk about from a sample and it depends on the sample size. If we have larger sample, we can talk about more of it in loose terms. And if we have small sample, we can not talk about or we cannot uh, talk about more about it. So in that sense, sample size gives such kind of a trade-off. And so it's generally assumed that if you have millions of features, and only 100 or 200 sample, you obviously cannot estimate efficiently all the importance of those millions of features. It's not possible intuitively as well. So that's why people use, assume, the sparsity, which say that there is an active set, which is the set of important features. So active set means the index of the features which are important to it. And this active set is very, very smaller than your number of observations. Although you have so many features in my in your hand, there are only few of them which are actually important. But the problem is we don't know which are those few which are important. So we have to find this active set. But to do theory, there is always assumption that it's not that 
the number of observed features which are important like s, s cannot be larger than n. Okay, so that then we cannot do efficient estimation or things like that. And it has been proved in some reference and some works that valid inference is possible if roughly s is of this order. Okay, s is less than n by log p kind of things. Okay, these are some mathematical things. Okay, and the next assumption now comes the complexity here. This is called a compatibility condition, first assumed by Van der Gate in 2007. It's much recent. Then, because at the first step, the lasso was proposed in a more heuristic and non mathematical way with computational things, and then people prove its properties later, much later around this 2005, 6, etc. So then they show that the, this condition is needed. Now, what this condition is saying to us, I need a bit of background to explain it. If you know what is the eigenvalue. And the eigenvalue is, suppose it is the L2 norm. Then it is beta prime beta. And this is the beta prime sigma hat beta. So in that way, the inverse of this quantity, if it is equality, it's an eigenvalue of this sigma matrix. It is called hat matrix, that x prime x, or your feature matrix. Okay, feature data matrix. So in some sort of is a weak assumption than assuming that it has a positive eigenvalue. Okay, and so if this condition can be relaxed a bit, what is happening? So that's called restricted eigenvalue condition. That is a bit restricted version of it, and it was then come at a later stage, at 2009, by Professor Bickel and his colleagues. So it now replaced this L1 norm by L2 norm. So this is more strict. And the existence of eigenvalue is much more stricter assumption. But we generally don't need that much. So it says that if it is not equal for eigenvalue existence, it has to be equal. But there is some positive number for which this inequality holds. That's fine. So in some sense gives you the sense that this matrix is well behaved. Your feature data matrix is in some sense well behaved. It is not obviously in i dimension it is not sing non-singular. So inverse cannot be taken. But it has at least one positive eigenvalue kind of things so that it can be approximated somehow its inverse. Okay, so that's the motivation behind that. Uh, but there is another condition that is, I think this is much more intuitive, but it comes later. It says, beta mean condition, that what is S complement? S complement is the features which are not important. Okay, so the larger the minimum non-zero coefficient, Okay, so non-zero coefficients, whichever is the minimum of it, has a larger value. Okay, that's the confusing thing I was thinking about. This should not be S complement. Okay, it will be S. So what it says, because in S complement, all the betas are zero actually, the true beta, because those are non, uh, non-important features. So the minimum values of the important features is sufficiently away from zero so that there is a clear cutoff. Like if you have the beta values, the true beta values like 2, 3, 1 and then all are zero and another is 200, 300, 100, a rest of zero, which one is easier to find? The 200, 300, 100 one, then you can easily cut a point between 100 and zero and say oh, these are important, these are not important rather than they are close to zero, like two, one, thing, okay? So this condition is basically saying that thing in a more mathematical way, that the minimum values in the your true component are sufficiently away from zero, so that that can be properly separated out. The important features are not important. When this condition is not satisfied, it's not satisfied in some cases where uh, you have 
like some fudgy features which may or may not be important to your variable. So you should, in your data, if you have features which are only significantly important to the variable and rest not important to the variable. In such cases, this condition is satisfied and then you can do a valid variable selection. So this is needed for a good variable selection things. Okay? Otherwise, if some actual value is close to zero, it is more likely to miss them because it's close to zero, so your algorithm might miss them as zero, but make them zero. Okay. So this is more intuitive condition, but second one is a bit further non-intuitive mathematical condition, and this doesn't have a visual interpretation as such. So I am just referring it here, but I am going to skip its details. It's just a mathematical condition in terms of that x prime x matrix or feature matrix. Okay, but the point is, and this is the most difficult condition to check for any given data. That's for sure. And there are some cases of design matrix or your feature matrix. If the feature matrix has bounded pairwise correlation, etc., then it is proof frame to be satisfied. But that's the most challenging task. And we will see that if this holds, we get the best property out of it, out of this algorithm. So even if this property is not going to hold, then also we can get some good property. But if this holds, we are getting the optimum solution in some way. So that's why this is till now the existing most restricted things. But there is a mathematical challenge that someone can come up with now uh, weaker assumption than this where the optimality holds. So that can be possible. So it's not even only things. Till now. And, but there is an interrelation between this assumption. As I have mentioned, this is the strict one. And then if this holds, then the previous two complicated condition also holds. But it is possible to do with either of these or these two conditions without this difficult one. Okay? So what are the properties? First we need, there are two kind of property we prove in high dimensional thing. One is the consistency of the estimate, that is the desired property we always look for. And second one is the optimality of the variable selection, that we select all the important variables. We are not losing any important variable. So first one is called consistency, that beta is estimated as close to the true value, in an asymptotic sense maybe. So this is the consistency of the lasso. So here again a bit complicated complication in the theorem. But you just look at this equation. What it says and what are the assumptions? There is no assumption other than sparsity. We said always we will assume sparsity. If we have just sparsity, then also lasso have this optimum property that this is the prediction error, right? Squared error, prediction error. So the prediction error will be small, okay? And if we choose lambda of this order, so if we choose the parameter lambda appropriately, then it, that's this go to zero. So prediction error tends to zero. So asymptotically, we are predicting the correct thing under no extra assumption with very high probability. This is the probabilistic statement. That's why this complication that with probability almost tending to 1, we can get the prediction correct. Now here, if you check formally, the rate of convergence is of the order 1 by root n. And then, if we just add another this compatibility condition, then we gain much more. Here, this prediction error as well as the estimation error, both are small. Okay, so this is also going to zero, this is also going to zero. So if we have the compatibility condition in our data, we can show that the estimation is also asymptotically correct and prediction is also asymptotically correct. Okay, so implication is that this we have bound for both prediction error and L1 error of the estimator. And then comes the variable selection properties regarding and there, as we have mentioned, those two conditions can be needed. One is we have complete separation between important and non-important variable. So if we have that property, 
that first one is restricted eigen value and then determine that it is well separated then s hat is always contained s so what does that mean s hat is the set of features which our algorithm is giving to us as important and s is the set of true important variables or true important features so under this condition that if they are well separated we are always getting the true positives or true features so we are never losing a true feature but is a asymptotic statement obviously and with probability tending to one so asymptotically we are not going to lose any good features but what is this implication means that we can have some false negative sorry false positive so we can have more features in our estimated set which are not important okay so that is the basic problem of lasso that since that toughest condition is not always true we always select more variable than what is actually true so we are not losing any true positive but we are selecting more false positive and so if this further this complicated condition holds then we have the best thing in the sense that asymptotically it will select exactly the same things which are important but if again this is the complex com condition it it may not be always holds unless the experiment is designed in a properly way okay but even this is enough for our purpose as long as we are not getting too many false positive but there is a drawback of lasso in many application it select too many false positive and so there are several advances of it the first one is adaptive lasso why why this is proposed this is proposed much later in 2006 only after 10 years of lasso it reduces the false positive of lasso okay so this so how it reduces the false positive we start with the lasso get the lasso estimate then put a weight over this penalty uh, with those lasso estimate and do this minimization another step so this is a two step adaptive things then what is this it makes some more coefficient as zero okay so if we have started with a million then your first lasso gives you 1000 then the second stage you reduce something maybe come up with 500 okay so in that way if you are thinking again 500x more you can do a multi stage adaptive lasso okay so in this way you can reduce your false positive so this is a simplest way but computationally more complex because you have to do those complex computation in each step so there are some other variants and obviously i will not go into details of them but weighted lasso is a defined weight like this there are multi step adaptive lasso as i have mentioned if it is the false positive is not reduced at the first stage you do it 3 4 times and then there is some relaxed lasso and group lasso group lasso is important in medical biometrics there are in from a biological background there could be some genes which are correlated so they can either be important together as a group or they cannot be important as a group together so in those cases people use the group lasso thing they either select those group of genes or does not select that group of genes okay so from there this group lasso comes and there are several extension of it on a graphical model network model etc okay and then there are some extension and so we can change this loss function instead of taking the square error loss as the classical wls estimator least square estimator we can change this loss or we can change this penalty right the loss is the first item now people try to make it advance so we can either change this loss we can change this penalty so when we change the loss there are called something called glm including the logistic model etc when you have discrete response okay in those cases people use the negative log like loop as the loss and these are the reference where it is done first and but this loss is still convex but then the complication comes there are some application okay this is the general convex loss function if we take and there are some 
cases where the loss function becomes non-convex. And then, as you have the background of computation, you know it's minimizing a non-convex objective function is much more difficult than the convex one. So then the, this problem becomes much more difficult. So these are different applications like finite mixture of regression. If you have mixture model of regressions or a mixed effect model, if you know it. So these things, mixed effect model is a kind of regression but there is a uh, grouping structure within it. The observation within a group are correlated. One example could be where it applies is you are doing a medical experiment over a randomly selected hospitals, maybe in a five hospitals. And you choose 50 patients from each of those five hospitals. Then the patients within a hospital are expected to be correlated in some way. So there, if you want to do analyze, analyze those kind of data, you need this kind of models, mixed models, either linear or generalized linear. But then, if you come write down the model and see the details, the function becomes non-convex. And so, comes the mathematical challenge. That's why you can see these works are much more recent. So the complexity increases and the things become recent. So, and there are some other extensions like graphical model, measurement error, noise model, and things like that. So, here are the references and you can check. So, since I'm running short of time, so I will just mention the penalty, how we can extend the penalty, and then we'll discuss the future things. And so, instead of loss function, we can also change the penalty. And that was a famous paper by Fan and Lee in 2001 who characterize which kind of function should be used as a penalty to give you a good properties. Okay? So these are the three properties they said, unbiasedness, sparsity, and continuity of this penalty function which we can use. Now, LQ norm, if we use here, then they satisfy the property two only if Q is greater than one, but does not, sorry, that if q is greater than 1 means l2 penalty or like that then it is this property is not satisfied okay one example of this is something called rich regression if you check you will get that it is not sparse it does not make any of your estimate as zero okay and if q is less than or equal to 1 then this first property is not satisfied and that's why when we are using lasso penalty we are having much more false positive because it is not unbiased. It has some modeling bias and that effect in the false positives. So L1 norm is also turns out to be not optimum and there are two recent work. One is by proposed by them. These two penalties becomes much more important but much more again computationally difficult. One is called SCAT penalty. It satisfies all these three but you can see the form is so many much complicated. Its derivative is given by this where this is the indicator function and this is the sign positive function. Okay? So, but if you implement this penalty, you will get much more better property of the estimator. But implementing this property with the non-convex loss is much more difficult. And optimization there is a very challenging thing. And people have doing these things. And another is much more than later, it's only 2010, it's called MCP penalty. It's a bit simplified form of this. Now, although these things look complicated, I can give you a flavor of how they look. This is the graph of the penalty. So this is the lasso, L1 penalty, you know, is the mod function. But scat penalty, it behaves like mod function near zero, and then it becomes flattened. And MCP penalty, penalty is much more flat. Okay? So it these are the some sort of relation, but near zero, they are all similar. That's why they all can select the variables. They can make some of the variables at exactly zero, like lasso. But a, they are flattening out to reduce the bias. Okay? So that there is not extreme biases in the endpoints. So these are the things and then there are some literature, here are the references where people work with the general loss function and this general penalty. 
like linear regression is their first paper, GLM by this. So these are for references. And then for the mixed model where the loss is non-convex and with this complicated loss function, they, they have itself done a paper and this is a bit our work with, uh, with Professor Thoresen from University of Oslo. Uh, it just got published. And then general non-convex loss, this one. Okay, so there we have done some kind of algorithm where loss curve function is non-convex, it can have any general form and the penalty is like SCAD or MCP penalty. But th there are again some challenges in terms of computational that needs to be sorted out. And so given that I have some details of our work but that I am going to skip now. Okay. So then I will come about what could be the robust method. Okay, so there are two approaches of robust inference. One is the minimum distance. So we take a statistical divergence which measures the some sort of distance between two denses, two data. Okay, two sets of data, two functions. Okay, so it is a non-negative function, it's equal to zero if and only if the two argument functions are equal. Then we take gn is a data, our f theta is the parametric model we have then minimize their divergence. So we choose theta as the minimizer of this quantity. Like theta can be the regression coefficient uh, in our model. So then we minimize this distance. So there will be minimum when gn is exactly equal to f theta and it will be close to minimum when we have close by. So that will give us a valid estimate and that is called the minimum divergence estimating equation. And why I have written the more MLE if you know the MLE, which is the maximum likelihood estimator and the most popular estimator or most widely used estimator, that can be written in this form with a fixed divergence. Okay? Given a form of rho, the MLE can be written as this form. And that details I am skipping. And then differentiating it, we get an estimating equation. So either we can uh, numerically minimize this quantity or solve try to find the root of this. And then there is another approach as I have mentioned. One is minimum distance and another is M estimation. M estimation deals with this kind of things that it minimizes a loss function which is additive in your data. So if we have N value, summation of NXY, a loss function, or is differentiating a bit of estimating equation. So either minimize it or estimate it. So there the point is which divergence to take here and here which row function and psi function to take. So those are the challenge and these are the true approach. Many people propose a defined row and say that it has a good property or bad property etc. And similarly here also many people have the form of this row or psi and they may have good property, bad property etc. So these are the two direction which is classically well established but now recently people have used started to extend it to the high dimension okay now so there are a lot of scope in high dimensional robustness because the people have till now do a bit of work in this approach the m estimation approach in high dimension but not in this approach and actually which i am also working on in this approach so what people do very few re recent work in M estimation approach. Why? There are only three to mention. So the first one is they take a divergence of this form for linear regression and then do, uh, do the things and get estimated. Where they use the L1 penalty and a fixed divergence. So one work and let's skip this properties. And another one is where they use this kind of divergence. So there are three works with three divergences, but only the first one is well established theory. I have skipped the formula, but here they have the estimating equation, but under linear regression, if they have used the L1 penalty and this function, this divergence, but there is no theoretical property is established here and no well established computational algorithm. So they have done a 
they do it just uh, gradient search because they are doing only for linear regression. Okay, no, the, what I mean is the theory is well established for the low dimensional set. It is all known that if we use this kind of only this without this penalty, it has very well known property. Now they ad hocly take that property and do this is a genetic epidemiology paper. So they do now mathematics, they take that background and add the penalty to group penalty to choose the group of genes and then they show that it is working empirically. So this is a Jang et al. recent paper in uh, genetic epidemiology. But there is, it's expected that it will have good property because it has good properties in low dimensional cases, but that's not yet proved. Which is one work we are trying. And there is another version, they have used a different divergence. It is also kind of same. They do some theory, but not all. Okay, this is not yet published. It is archived paper in 2007. And it is under review, they said. So they use a different divergence. So these two divergence best work. They show that they have the potential to work in empirical cases. So they can be applied or further extended. And both of these work have only done the linear regression things. So there's scope that we extend it beyond linear regression in more complex cases and also try to show how good they are theoretically or mathematically if you are interested. So these two are the recent works in this area. And so that's basically all. But all this take again only the L1 penalty. So we can use those better penalty like SCAD and things and check how it is working and that is one project I am working on currently is to do the second one that I have shown that genetic epidemiology paper they have proposed the divergent and then there I am trying to check how it will work with SCAT and the theory some because SCAT penalty has some good property and the theory are a bit easier because they have all those three important properties. Okay. So that is a, that's why it is a question mark whether it will be completed in 2007 or 18, 17 or 18, I don't know yet. I'm doing with uh, one of my friend in USA. And so that's the thing and there is so lots of scope in the direction to work with. So just before ending, as I mentioned, there is a well-developed theory of M estimation. If any of you are interested, I am giving the references here that theories like Low and Wainwright and these are the recent papers which deals with the theory and application of the M estimation based approach all together. So if you are interested you can look at these recent papers. Uh, so I will say that those are the uh, future scope, DPT Lasso and LDPD also those two recently proposed methods, study them better and beyond the regression and their adaptive version also because like Lasso they may have some false positive. So explore that and with well developed computational algorithm and then go beyond linear regression with non-convex loss function and this kind of things so that we can get robust estimator in the complex cases like mixed model etc. Uh, there is one thing that I ha till now I have talked about is only how to estimate and select the variables. I haven't talked about how to get the p-values. You all know the p-values to do the significance testing. But that is not known in the high dimensional context for long time. And it is possibly the first paper in 2010 which gives some idea. So that part is still now new. So how to do the inference testing in the high dimensional context. Okay. So here are only some references. No, 2009 or 9 or 10. This is from ETH Zurich paper. Uh, so they first give some idea of the p-value in the high dimensional context. And then there are some works. But again, all these works, uh, since all of them are new, they have started only doing it for lasso which was proposed in 1996. So, if, when you are doing some robust inference, 
you can obviously then develop the robust testing and things like that. And this has a lot of uh, application in biometrics or mostly in genomics analysis. Because all genetic data are high dimensional and if you have some outlying values, your this work becomes much more useful. That's why all these recent papers are very good journal publications if you just look at the references. So the scope is plenty and so there are two ways. One is computational and another is mathematical. So you can work in either way or collaborate or things like that. So I think that's all. And lots of references. You can get the PPT later if you are interested to check the references. And that's all. Thank you. And if you have any question. All, not all, the initial approach of LASSO 